morning and welcome to Christ Lutheran Church and School. What a joy it is to be with you all again as we continue another week with our online only service, but we still remain connected and united in Christ even though we're online. It's such a joy that we can share this time in God's word together as we worship and praise him. This week we're on week seven of our Philippians sermon series and, and really we're just building off of last week when we talked about joy, now we're going to start making moves forward as we talk about rejoicing. And our time in God's Word will be in Philippians 4, talking about rejoicing. But before we do that, we prepare our hearts with our opening song. And we begin this morning in the power and the presence of our God, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with a responsive psalm. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. And my friends, we turn to our time of confession and forgiveness, and this is our time where we confess before God and one another that we have Sin. We have not lived rejoicing, repeating the sound of joy that comes from Jesus in our lives. We have fallen into temptation and sin, and it has stealing, stolen our joy from our Lord and Savior. And so today we confess our sins, those sins in our hearts, and we lay them at the foot of the cross as we take time to confess those sins. And together we confess. Jesus we confess that we have not lived in the joy you give. We have been selfish in the gifts you have given us. We have been anxious living in the unknowns of this world. Forgive us. Turn our joy into rejoicing. Turn our anxiety into anticipation of your power and might at work. Renew us by your spirit to go forward in faith. Keep our hearts and minds focused on you. 
And my friends, hear the good news. Almighty God has had mercy on us and sent his son to die for us for our sake. And as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our children's sermon, and so I invite the kids to, if you want to get a little bit closer, but this is going to be a loud children's sermon, so, um, I mean, I'm going to be loud. I don't want you to be loud at home. I'll get in trouble for that. But today, I want to talk about rejoicing. If you remember last week, I talked about joy, and what gives us joy is Jesus, and, and how his joy is always with us, and we get to share that joy And when we share the joy of Jesus, that's actually called rejoicing. So, how many of you have ever heard an echo? Or you know what an echo is? Like when you're yelling in like a loud, open area and you hear your voice echo, 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 echo. Let me, all right, so you can hear my voice because I have a a, a microphone on, so it makes it really loud. But if I turn it off, I'm going to turn it off. All right, I don't want to lose my voice, but you know what an echo sounds like? It, it just keeps going and going and going and bouncing off and, and going, and, and people can keep hearing it over and over again. And that's what rejoicing means, is we're like an echo of the joy we have in Jesus. And so when we talk about Jesus, when we, when we forgive one another, when we share and invite other, other people to you know, hear about Jesus... We are rejoicing because we are an echo of the joy that we have in Jesus. And so maybe next time you probably have to be in like, you know, a a bunch of rocks around or we were on a trail once hiking and there was like a little cave and we could hear an echo. And and it's it's a great thing to think about of rejoicing because we rejoice because Jesus died for us on the cross to save us. But you know where the echo is the loudest? Is in the empty tomb when he rose from the dead. And out of the tomb echoes life, life for us here and now and life forever with him. And that's the loudest echo that we get to share, that Jesus has died for us, that he has risen from the dead, that he is with us, and that we live with him forever. And that, that is what rejoicing is. And so don't shout at home, find a good place, talk to your parents about a place where you can try to hear your echo. But when you hear the echo, think about how we are an echo of the love and forgiveness of our Lord and Savior Jesus. So let's do an echo prayer. That's why we call it an echo prayer. And so we'll do an echo prayer. Dear Jesus, Jesus, we thank you you for the joy joy we have in you. you. Help us us to rejoice, to to be an echo echo of your love love and your forgiveness forgiveness. so that others others may know You are the Christ. Christ. We thank you you. and love you. you. Amen. Amen. All right, parents, I said not to shout at home, so if they are doing it at home, that's not my fault. So our reading today is going to sound a lot like an echo from last week because we're still in Philippians 4, but this week it's more of a an instruction to go forward step by step. And, and you just love it when God's word gives you the ways to live out what he is calling us to do. And so Philippians 4, uh, verses 1 through 9 is our reading and our time and focus in God's word. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Iota and I entreat Syntaki to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our theme song. Well, God's grace, mercy, and peace and joy be with you. Amen. This morning as we continue our series in Philippians and we talk about rejoicing in our reading today, Paul starts off with some very heartfelt words. And if you remember, his opening in chapter 1 talks about how he holds this church in Philippi in his heart. And how he longs for them and he prays for them. And they have a special place in his heart. And And I was thinking about that as we have another week of of an empty church that it's the same prayer we all have here is that we long for one another and and we have a special place for one another in our heart as brothers and sisters in Christ. And and I thought it might be fun just to kind of look at a good reminder of, of what this place looks like when it's filled up. This was grandparents day so about six months ago I believe this was six months and it was just packed and the kids are singing and and everyone is just rejoicing because the joy we have in Jesus and and it can be tempting to look back and be like wow I wish I wish we were back at that point but it doesn't matter as we talked about last week joy goes beyond any circumstance And Paul is talking here, and it's a great reminder here in that opening verse, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, right? We love and long for one another. We look forward to that day when we can gather again. But he still says, you're my joy and my happy. Stand firm in the Lord. He says, stand firm in your joy. Because your joy is going to cause rejoicing. So stand firm and rejoice together despite the circumstance, because when we share in the joy and we share in that rejoicing, we remain united in the love of Christ and the love of one another. And so I just love the way we start off 
that verse in, in Philippians 4 because it's a great reminder that, okay, yeah, we're online right now, but I've been so encouraged by how many people continue to reach out online, people that send emails, people that send cards, and we send cards back and forth and, and go back and forth. Even online, we are rejoicing, and we're standing firm, and we're showing the love that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so it, it might look different than that picture, but like I said last week, we are connecting with people all over the country right now, and what a great joy to look at even in trials, and what a great cause to rejoice. And today, today we're going to look at how do we live a life rejoicing, all right? So we got our source of joy last week, talking about Jesus and our joy and our salvation and the gift of joy that comes from Christ. So today we got to talk about how do we then take that joy and go forward in a life of rejoicing. And I love the way that Paul starts because Paul talks about some good relationship advice right after he talks about how much he loves those people in Philippi. He's like, all right, now let me, let me give you some relationship advice because I don't like it when the church isn't united. And so Paul's like, let's get everyone back together. And maybe, maybe with everything going on, this is some good relationship advice. Maybe this is a good reminder to remain united with all the challenges and trials we still have, still have facing us that you know what? we got to keep our focus. we got to remain united in our mission together. And Paul points to it right out, and he talks to the two ladies. He says to Yedon and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Agree in the Lord. What's the focus? God in the Lord. He's, he's reminding them of the goal. The goal is sharing the gospel. The goal is living a life of joy and rejoicing. And so he says, agree in the Lord, right? There might be some disagreements, but we can agree in the mission of sharing the love and the joy we have in Jesus. So he says, agree in the Lord. Now, take that advice and put it in your own life. Think about how many fights and arguments you had in your life because of disagreements about earthly things. Now think about if you, next time you have an argument that you think about the Lord first, how is that going to change the way you treat one another? If you're to be an echo of joy, how are you going to approach a disagreement? You'll approach it in a much loving and forgiving way than probably before. And so he says, get them back on board, and he says, get them back to the work they were doing before, sharing the gospel together, and then he points them to the even greater focus because he says, your names are in the book of life. And it's an echo of what Jesus says in Luke 10 when he sends his disciples out and they're going around and they're casting out demons and they're tromping on the, on the serpents, right? And, and Jesus says, don't have joy, don't rejoice in that, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. I mean, think about that. The next time you have an argument, hey, you know what? We ha we're, our goal is to spend eternity together, so we should probably get along in this little bit of time that we have in this world right now because we're going to have eternity together. See, that's the goal. The goal is to have the assurance, the confidence that Jesus says your name is in the book of life. Your name is recorded in heaven because our names are recorded in the book of heaven through our baptism, through our faith in Christ then you know what? It makes it a lot easier to, to live with one another, to love one another, because that's the big goal. Our goal is always to proclaim Christ, to share Christ, so that more people will know him and more people will live in this lifetime rejoicing and then rejoice for eternity with him. That's always our focus. That's always our goal as a church and a school. And I love that because it keeps you united on the mission. And then he says, all right, now that you're on the united in the mission, you're keeping your focus on your source of joy, your joy and your salvation that we talked about last week. Now that you have your focus, now I need you to start living it out. And this is what he says, and he goes on in, in verse 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. I love it. It's an echo. And you know what else I love about that verse? It's a command. 
How many times have you heard this and thought of it as a command? It's not a suggestion. It's an imperative. It's a command. Rejoice. And it's a command like any other, because he repeats it. He echoes it twice, back to back. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. There's no other command written like that in Scripture. When, Jesus, when God was giving Moses the Ten Commandments, he didn't say, all right, don't go kill anybody. Again, I say don't go kill anybody. But here, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has Paul rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. A command to live it out. And it's a command that I think sometimes we don't take very seriously. It's a command that I've overlooked in my life to rejoice always. To, to echo the source of joy we have in Jesus despite any circumstance or trial we're facing. To rejoice always. Always. And you might be like, okay, what is rejoice, right? It's that echo of joy. And, and here's, here's the simplest way I can, re- it can explain rejoicing. And, and it comes from a couple, couple nights ago, I had a steak dinner. And it was a steak from, from my dad's farm in Nebraska. So I know it was homegrown, it was home raised. Like, you know, he, he talks to the cows, he takes care of them all. And, and then, you know, he... He ships us the, the steaks, and I'll just tell you, I mean, that was the best steak I ever had. Last night, or a couple nights ago, just eating it, just a lot of joy. A lot of joy in eating that steak. It was, like, perfectly cooked. I don't know how it happened, but it just happened. And it was, I mean, just so tender. I could have cut it with a butter knife. And it was so good. I was, I was sharing it. I was like, all right, Melissa, you got to try this. you got to try this. And she was like, oh, this is so good. This is so good. And you see, that's, that's a simple way of rejoicing. Because when you have something that is so good, you have to talk about it, and you have to share it with others. That's why Paul is saying this is a command. If you have the joy that you have in Jesus, you should be rejoicing because you have something so good, you can't help but talk about it. You can't help but share it. You want to share it with other people so that they know just how good God is. That's why he's saying rejoice in the Lord no matter what you're going through. And it's a command, and it's a command that's hard to live out. But, but Paul gives us the way to live this out. Because he goes on, he goes on, let your gentleness be known. Let your gentleness be known or evident to all. The Lord is near. It says in some other translations, let your reasonableness be known. You see, that's the reason we want to rejoice, because when everything's falling apart, don't you know people like, when, when everything's falling apart, when everything looks bad, don't you know people that can just stand there and kind of smile and look calm? And you're like, why are they so calm all the time? Why are they so confident? How come they're not falling apart and nervous and worried about everything going on? It's that time where you can share the reason. You can rejoice. You can share the joy you have. That's why he's saying, let your reasonableness, let your gentleness be known. You know, you all know people in your life that are negative people, right? Just, you know them, right? They are always going to be negative, right? If they win the lottery, if they win the lottery and they're like, yep, I just won $300 million, but guess what? i got to pay half of it in taxes, right? You all know people that are always looking at the negative side. But don't you want to be around people that when everything's falling apart, they're standing firm? That when, when everything sounds negative and everything, like the glass is half full, they're overflowing, with joy and confidence, and you want to be around those people. And that's why God is saying, rejoice always, because let your reasonableness be known, because when you're rejoicing, they're going to look and say, how are you doing that? And that gives the opportunity to say, because I have a joy, I have a confidence, I have a hope in Jesus that overcomes anything this world has to offer, anything this world can throw against me. I've got Jesus. That's my reason. And it says, the Lord is at hand. And I love this because you can take it one of two ways. The Lord is at hand, meaning the Lord is near. Other translations say the Lord is near, right? Meaning like 
He is right there with you, right? As, as Emmanuel, God with us. So he is with us. And we talked about that last week, that in the presence of God is the joy, and he is with us. And so God is near, and so we can rejoice. The other way to look at it is the Lord is at hand, meaning he's coming again. He's coming again soon, and he's coming again with full power and full glory, unlike anything we've ever seen. And I wonder, how, many, how much time do you spend thinking about that day? Or that day when either he comes, or the day when he calls you home, how much time do you think about the things that are above? You know, uh, what we like to do a lot is, is, you know, it's kind of harder in L.A. with all the city lights, but when you get out, and last month we were at, at Big Bear Lake, and we were able to look outside, and you could see all the stars. All the stars shining, we just have our head up looking at all the stars. And, and I asked the kids, I'll ask you, how many stars do you think you could see and count at one time? Like, if you're looking up, and you could take a picture of just your eyesight. How many stars do you think you'd be able to count? They said at any point, a person with normal vision would be able to see about 10,000 stars in the sky. But yet the sky just looks filled, doesn't it? But it's only about 10,000 that you actually see. Here's what's amazing when you start to picture the things above, when you start to picture God at hand coming into the presence of God for eternity. Here's a good picture in Revelation 5. This is John talking. He says, I, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And, and all these angels are around the throne of God. And that throne, we hear in, in chapter 4 of Revelation, we get to sit on that throne with Christ. And you have 10,000 times 10,000 angels. Now, any math majors out there, you know what that is? I had to take off my shoes to count. It's 100 million. 100 million. Just to try to put it in perspective about how much rejoicing is going on in heaven. And all the angels rejoicing. And here's a, here's a big, big difference. As great as it is that the angels are rejoicing, God desires our rejoicing even more. Because the angels were created, and they were rejoicing as perfect beings in heaven. You and I were created, and because of sin, we're imperfect. And isn't that amazing that the God of heaven desires the imperfect rejoicing of us? Because it means that we have our focus right. It means we have our, our goal right, that our, our Savior came to save us. Our joy is in Christ, and it causes us to rejoice. And it causes all of heaven to rejoice. And what a picture that is. And if that doesn't get you excited to rejoice, I don't know what will. So there's the command, there's the way that we can rejoice. Now, there's another command in our reading today. If it wasn't hard enough to think about a life of always rejoicing, here's the next command Paul gives. Don't be anxious about anything. <laughs> Have you read the news lately? That sounds like a really good suggestion. Don't be anxious about anything. But yet it's, it's, a, it's a command. It's in the imperative. It's another command. Don't be anxious. I mean, think about that. What if today... What if after today you could live with, without worrying about anything? You didn't have to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow, five years from now, ten years from now. You're not anxious about your health. You're not anxious about your bank account. You're not anxious about what's going to happen with the coronavirus. You're not anxious about anything. You're living a life that God called you to live without being anxious. And right now you're probably thinking you're these are two commands that are impossible. You're telling me to rejoice always and to not be anxious. Well, I'm just an echo of what God's saying. All right? God's saying, rejoice always, don't be anxious. So how do you do this? How do you do this? It says, but in everything, 
by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You want to live a life where you're not anxious? Give it all to God. Give your anxiety, your fear, your doubt. Give it to God. He says, give everything to Him. By prayer and petition, make your request known to Him. Tell Him to take it. Take this anxiety. Take this fear from me. Take it. And do it with thanksgiving because, look, we get to talk to God. We get to give that to God. As Christians, that is the greatest gift we have is to come before the throne of God and give Him our fear and our anxiety. I think that's maybe the hardest thing for people who don't know God is what do they do with their anxiety? What do they do with their fear? That's why he says, bring it with thanksgiving because you have a God who loves and cares for you, who wants you to bring that to him. He says, present it to God and leave it in his hands. Give it to him and leave it there. You know, we have, we have four kids. And two, I'm not, I won't name names because I don't know. They're going to be watching it, and they, they sometimes get, get on me sometimes about it. So I'll just say two of our kids, like if I tell them to do something, they'll go and do it. Like they'll get it done. There's the two other kids of ours, if we tell them to go clean their room and we go up there in about a half hour, they pulled every piece of clothing out of their, out of, out of their closet, and they're building tents and forts out of it. And it's like, Maybe, maybe you know people like that, or, or maybe at work, you know at work how, how when you give someone a project, you know that they're just going to go and do it. You don't really have to follow up with them because they've proven it to you time and time again that they're reliable and you can count on them to get the project or task or job done. But then you also know people that you have to follow up with quite a bit because you're like, hey, are you doing this? Are you getting this done? Here's, here's some advice. Here's, here's some things you can do, you can do. And I was thinking about that too. It's like, isn't that what we do with our prayers to God? We'll bring our petitions and our prayers to him. And then when he doesn't act quickly enough or in the way we want, we start to try to tell him how to do his job. We start to think that we can't trust him to do his good and gracious will. And we keep going and going and going to him in different ways and with new things and, and going to him instead of just saying, here it is, God, you take it. Now give me the strength to walk in it no matter how long that will be. Because God has proven it time and time again that he takes care of his children. Time and time again, God has shown us in Scripture, and maybe even in your own life, you have seen him how he has worked to the point where you can trust him, where you can give it to him and let him take it from there. And I know there's other verses in the Bible that God's talking about, come to me, pester me, bother me, keep coming to me. But at some point in your Christian faith, in your walk, you just got to turn it over to God. So I, don't, I can't do it anymore, God. You take it and you lead me no matter how hard it is, no matter what the trial is. You're with me. You lead me through it. Because I don't want to live with anxiety anymore. I don't want to be fearful anymore. I want to live fearlessly and I want to live boldly for you, rejoicing at all times. And look, that's God's promise to you. In the very next verse, He's, it says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you ever think about the peace of God? It says the peace of God. Not peace like God or peace in somewhat form, but the very peace of God. This is why when we share the peace, right? You're sharing the peace of God. Have you ever thought about that phrase? You ever thought about how peaceful God is right now? Do you think he's anxious about anything? Do you think he's worried about what's going to happen tomorrow? Or 10 years or 1,000 years from now? No. Because he's got all things in his hands. He has the power. He's, he's got it all in his hands. And our job is to put it in his hands to trust and to live in the peace that he promises 
when we put it in his hands, when we walk day by day in faith, going forward, trusting as he is leading. He says he's going to guard your hearts and your minds. This peace will be in your heart and in your mind. And now, when you have the peace of God, it changes the way you live and it changes the way you focus. And so Paul encourages then, now that you have the peace of God, now he says, this is where you need to focus. He says, think about these things. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellence, anything worthy of praise, anything that brings about rejoicing, think about these things. I mean, that's not an all-inclusive list, but I think it covers a lot about what we have in our Lord and Savior Jesus. To think about those things, the joy of our salvation, the cause of us rejoicing, the promise of His peace, the promise of His presence, to look back and look at all the ways God has continued to work in the lives of His people. He said, think about those things. Be encouraged by those things. And let me just ask you this. Do you spend more time worrying about your problems than you do focusing on the promises and presence of God? Have you looked more and read more on your phone, right? The, you know, scrolling through all the information, all the articles, everything that's going on in our world. And I'm not saying don't be uninformed. I'm just saying, are you spending more time going through that? Are you spending more time in prayer and more time in the peace and the presence that can only come through Jesus? Because I think a lot of us just focus on our problems instead of the promises in the presence of Jesus. See, it's almost like this. I brought this as an example. See what this is? That's a problem, all right? I got a problem. <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, you got a lot of problems. My wife's like, yeah, he's got a lot of problems. But this is a problem, right? Now, what happens when you have a problem? That's all you can see is that problem, right? At home, that's all you can see, right? It's a problem. That's all you can see. And the more you look at your problem, what happens? The more you focus on the problem. And then all of a sudden, that problem is just right here. So now you walk around, and everyone else can see that you have a problem. And that's a big difference. When people look at you and see that you have a problem, instead of people looking at you and saying, I'm rejoicing in my Savior. And so what are you focused on? Your problems or the promises and presence of Jesus? Because that's going to determine the way you rejoice. The way you live out your life as a Christian. What God has called us to do, to rejoice, to live without anxiety. To go forward trusting Him. And not only just to think about those things, but look what he says. Paul says, then, the things which you have learned, received, heard, and saw in me, do these things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul's saying, don't just think about it, right? Because thinking about it is good, but when you think about it, it actually has to be an action. So he says, now start to live it out, all right? He's going all the way back to verse 4, all right? Now you've seen how you can live this out, how to rejoice always, how to not be anxious, how to give it to God, how to follow him, to trust in his promise and his presence, to go forward and live it out in that peace because the God of peace will be with you. God is with you every step of the way as we keep going forward. What a great promise. What a great word of encouragement to keep going forward rejoicing without fear. And he brings it all home. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Don't be anxious about anything. Keep your mind focused on the things above. And I think a lot of times if you're hearing this, and, and maybe you've thought this already, but it kind of sounds like, you know, Pastor Cal, that's great, but it doesn't seem like that's reality. You just want me to live with my head in the clouds? No, I, no, I want you to live in the reality, the reality that one day we're going to stand before Jesus. Whether that's a reality you believe or not, that is a reality. That's the truth of God's word. 
The reality is that Jesus is at hand. He's coming again. That Jesus is with us. The reality is we should be rejoicing in any trial. The reality is we shouldn't be anxious about tomorrow because we trust that God has it. See, today I'm asking you to live in the reality of rejoicing always. The reality that can only come through knowing and believing and following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The reality to stand firm in the Lord. The reality that one day he's going to welcome us home as his children. That, that reality that one day we will be with Jesus and all those who have gone before us in the faith with a never-ending rejoicing where we won't be anxious about anything, a reality we can live right here and now, and a reality that we will get to experience for all of eternity. And so, my friends, stand firm in the Lord. Stay united on our mission together that our books, that our names are written in the book. Stand firm in the reality that Jesus is with us. Stand firm in the reality that the peace of God is with us, the Holy Spirit is within us to live out our life rejoicing. We live out our life sharing the gospel until that day when we join the hundred million angels singing and rejoicing for all of eternity. And until that day, may the God of all peace, of all comfort, and of all joy guard our hearts and our minds and our lives in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue our service as we make confession in our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and together we confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we continue with our prayers today. And today, I just I want to give you guys time just to pray, um, especially with the verses we heard today in Philippians 4 about bringing all of your prayers and petitions to the Lord, to not be anxious about anything but to give that to the Lord. And so whatever is on your heart today, I encourage you to, to give that into the hands of God. And we'll have a time where I'm just going to step aside and, and you can look at the cross and you can bow your head or, or whatever and you can just lay it out there and, and put it in the hands of God today, trusting that he is with you, that his peace will overcome you. And so today in our prayers for our church family and our school families, for our community and for our world, um, just continued prayers as we continue going forward uh, and just continued prayers of thanksgiving. Uh, it, if you heard the piano today, that Christopher is back, and so prayers for thanksgiving that um, he is back and able to use his gifts to rejoice and, and to help us worship our Lord and Savior. And so we'll lift him up in prayer as well. And so let us pray. Good and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, today we come before you rejoicing in the joy of our salvation, that our names are written in the book, that you are our source of joy that causes us to rejoice, that will cause others to see us during trials, during hard times, that we can use those opportunities to point them to you. We ask that you continue to be with our church and our school as we continue to, continue to go forward sharing the gospel. Our focus is always on you and sharing that gospel, that love and forgiveness we have in Christ. We pray that we continue to be encouraged 
to live lives of rejoicing, that we continue to be encouraged to live fearlessly, that we're aware of what's going on in our world, but yet we know and we're focused on the greater things that you are at work at that we might not see yet, but we pray that you give us the patient endurance to continue going forward. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who are injured, battling disease. We pray for our whole nation, for our whole world, that we pray that there's healing from this coronavirus. We, we pray for the work that's been done so far. We pray for those that are providing healing and, and service right now. We lift up anyone that is suffering any disease, any physical or, or mental or, or financial impact right now, that you be their source of joy to cause even rejoicing in these hard times. Heavenly Father, we pray for all of our leaders. We pray for all those who serve to protect freedom. We pray for all the armed forces, for those who are deployed right now, we ask that you keep them safe and watch over them. We pray for police officers and first responders, for firefighters. We ask that you keep them safe as well and continue to be with their families during these tough times. And Heavenly Father, we just take this time right now to put whatever we have in our hearts and in our minds and we put any anxiety or fear, and we lift those into your hands right now. God, we know that you are with us. We trust in your promises. We pray that your peace may overflow from our lives. And we lift all these prayers and petitions into your holy hands, trusting in your love and care for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And together we pray the prayer our Lord and Savior Jesus has taught us as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And my friends, as we end our time together here and as we go out into our home and neighborhood and our world, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his peace. Amen. And just a few announcements before we close our time together. Um, as we mentioned last week, a great opportunity to be encouraged by one another, a, wom a women's group that is forming that will be led by Betty Riker, and it starts August 6th on Zoom. Uh, so it is an online group for women to go over the book. It's, it's called It's Not Supposed to Be This Way, and it sounds like an amazing opportunity to be encouraged together, to stand firm together um, during these times and to to rejoice with one another during these times as you go through this, this book and, and hear God's word speak um, as well. And so if you want more information on that, Betty's email and phone number is right there. So um, please pray about that and be encouraged to join that amazing uh, women's group that's starting. And then lastly, um, just our announcements again. Um, you know, thank you. Thank you all for the continued support as, as we continue to partner in the gospel together. And we just encourage you that as you continue to look at how God uses you to be a blessing to others, that our online giving options are right here as ways to continue to, 
to rejoice together, to be in partnership of the gospel and, and what we're all about here at Christ Lutheran. And so to, to pray and to, to give with joy and to give generously as you're able, but to do it in joy and rejoicing that we're able to do this together and, and what a great joy it is. And so, my friends, I thank you. I thank you again for, for being part of our, our church family online, our online church family, and what a joy it is to be a part of that family here at Christ Lutheran. And, and may God continue to be with you, and may we continue to rejoice with one another, rejoice together in our Lord and Savior Jesus. Have a great week in God's promises and his presence and in his peace.